Hello, this is Dan. Uh, my wife and I have put together some videos about leaving oneness Pentecostalism. Uh, <clears throat> the last segment we started was concerning uh, the legalism and some of the standards. Um, we're not finished with that yet. Uh, we still have another portion to do. Uh, things have been a little uh, busy lately, so I kind of have that on hold. Um, I just decided to do a video uh, in the meantime uh, to tie up some loose ends um, about speaking in tongues. Uh, some of the stuff we've talked about before, but I wanted to kind of go in deep, uh, deeper about some of the things. <clears throat> uh, so, um, yeah, so with Oneness Pentecostal uh, speaking in tongues... Um, well, let me just, uh, just give a recap. Um, a time came after coming to faith in Christ where I became desirous to follow Jesus more zealously. I was baptized. I had not done so yet as a believer. It did give me an assurance and boldness to declare Christ I did not have before. Uh, what one may describe as being filled with the Spirit. I believe this is because baptism conveys God's promise that through our faith in Christ our sins are forgiven. But this did not involve speaking in tongues, as some would suggest is needful for such, although I did for a time get caught up in that error. We live in a time many are being led to believe false gospels because of false teachings concerning miracles. And so I'm confident in acknowledging that I drifted into this, but God has now steadied me, and I feel the need to admonish others regarding this in their faith journey as well. Um, so, with that being said, um, this uh, ex it, what the Pentecostal speaking in tongues is, it's called ecstatic speech, uh, glossolalia. Um, that's the thing that goes on in, in these churches. Um, when we use the word ecstatic, it generally refers to the practice of, uh, the, it generally refers to the practice being done in a state of emotion or prompted by a spiritual, mystical experience. It can, however, be easily begun without this, as I'm about to demonstrate. Now, here's the thing. Anyone can do this. Anyone can put together vowels and consonants randomly. You just start out slow. You can, you, you can do it. Ah, da, ka, pa, ta, sha. Okay, but the idea is it gets faster and more repetitive. Ah, da, ba, pa, pa, sha, ka, ta, da, la, pa, ta, da, da, ka, ta, da, la, da, sha. It's the same thing, I'm just doing it faster. And that's what this ecstatic speech is. It's faster, it's more repetitive. You're just putting vowels and consonants together randomly. Um, now, now, notice the difference between that and typical language pattern. Now, I'm going to say something that's uh, Spanish. Um, I have it written out. Um, my Spanish is a little off lately, but I took a little bit in high school and college, but... Um, but just listen to it. Just someone saying something in a language. Hola, como estas? Mi nombre es Dan. No comprendo mucho español. You see the difference from So, <clears throat> you see the difference? So although I say sometimes it's pretend language speaking, it's actually something a bit different. Uh, typical ecstatic speech is fast and repetitive, unlike the phonetic pattern of actual language speaking. This is probably why it also has the relaxing, hypnotic effect it does for a while. I mean, after a while. <clears throat> and especially as it's done more loudly and as an emotional release. And it's funny because after a while you start to realize 
it all sounds the same. And people will slow it down a bit, I would, uh, to try to make it sound more real. Uh, that should have um, told me something about what I was doing in the first place, but I didn't think about it at the time, obviously. <clears throat> um, now, peop you know, the people in this movement will they'll say, you know, you know, based on what I'm telling, um, they'll say, well, you didn't have the true experience, or uh, it's only the true occurrence of tongues if it's the spirit that gives the utterance. Okay, um, generally, what is meant by that is this ecstatic speech, which they believe is the uh, the, the gift of speaking in tongues, um, or this practice of what they think is the, the biblical speaking in tongues, um, this ecstatic speech has to be prompted by the emotional, spiritual, mystical experience to begin with to even be considered legitimate, um, especially the first time. And I did have quite a bit of those occurrences being in the movement over the years, uh, quite often actually. Um, but... There's a few problems with this reasoning. This occurs in pagan religions, too. I didn't know this was a thing when I got into Pentecostalism, but you and as you go, right? Um, think about this for a second. If it's not exclusive to Christianity, that's a big red flag. It doesn't mean if you do it, it's because you're possessed or something, uh, although there's probably some who are, too. Uh, but the practice itself is not a bad thing. Just like saying we eat peanut butter jelly sandwiches and pagans eat peanut butter jelly sandwiches. It's generally a neutral thing, but it's something anyone is able to attain to. And people have simply learned to incorporate it into their spiritual practices and experiences. Um, and now what do I mean by incorporating it into our experiences think about it if you're in a setting that promotes and even expects this of you having others around you doing it you will probably at some point become more comfortable to begin trying it whether right away or eventually perhaps quite spontaneously whether influenced by genuine worship to God or other mystical experiences and that's understandable Here's another thing. Once one gets used to doing this, whether or not more spontaneously at times than others, and the more it's done during spiritual moments, especially when it's so encouraged and expected, it becomes second nature to associate the two. Experiences with practice. Uh, experiences with the practice. And you end up wanting to do it every time you're in a spiritual moment as kind of reactionary. That's why even out of the Pentecostal church, um, the habit still lingered at times uh, for a while when uh, in a church worship service. But I deliberately refrained from doing it. So what should we think of ecstatic speech from all of this? In and of itself, it's not bad to do it, it's just simply not what biblical speaking in other languages, tongues, is, which is actual foreign languages, which is what you see in Acts chapter 2, day of Pentecost, when, this, uh, when the church started, the Spirit was poured out, and they began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave the utterance. And it was actual languages that people there spoke. They heard them speaking their languages. Um, okay, so, uh, how did all this happen? Um, basically what happened in Pentecostalism, particularly oneness Pentecostalism, in the early 1900s, is that... Uh, the belief that you haven't been filled with the Spirit, um, and particularly oneness Pentecostalism, Pentecostalism, that you haven't even been born of the Spirit until you've 
spoken in tongues led to the incorporation of ecstatic speech to claim that as the biblical occurrence of speaking in other tongues. And there's a fallacy involved with how this came about. Um, it's this idea of because something happened means it will always happen. That's the idea. It's a fallacy. Um, just because something did happen in the Bible doesn't mean it will always happen. Um, let's look at Mark's, Mark chapter 16. This, they'll, they'll go to this a lot to try to prove their point, but it, I mean, the text itself is self-explanatory, I think, but chapter 16 in Mark, um, verse uh, 17, And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on the sick people and they will get well. Okay, so they take that and say, see, this is what believers are going to do. They're going to speak in tongues. Wait, what else did it say? Well, it's the first thing it said. These are the signs of those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons. Okay, so if if every believer is expected to speak in tongues, well, according to that logic, every believer is expected to drive out demons. Every believer will pick up snakes and it won't hurt them. Every believer will uh, be able to drink deadly poison. Every believer will lay hands on people and they'll get well. So you see the logic, the ill logic there? Okay. <clears throat> Um, but this text, where it speaks of these kinds of things that will follow believers, um, it's the same, it's the same kind of thing that you see with Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 to 14, where he talks about, you know, there'll be these different gifts that not everybody has, um, not everyone's going to have the same kind of gift, and in that, he talks about speaking in tongues being one of them. Um, he has the rhetorical question, does everybody speak in tongues? No, that, that's a rhetorical question. No, of course not. So it's the same kind of thing here. Um, these are the kinds of things you're going to see among believers. It doesn't mean every believer is going to do all of these things. Um, or even all of them are going to have one of these gifts. You know, like, it's the logic there. It, it, uh I believe I believed it for a while. Um, they convinced me of it for a while. Uh, I don't know how I worked around it at the time, but um, anyway. Uh, so the Bible does speak about being filled with the Spirit as a distinct aspect of life in the Spirit once we've come to faith in Jesus, uh, once we've already been born of the Spirit. But this is not always an immediate thing upon saving faith, nor is it always going to include speaking in another language. Uh, when you look at Paul's teaching about the gift um, and see what happens in Acts, it is clear God meant for it in those situations. But that was his plan. And it's always his plan when and for what reason these things occur. It's not something for us to try to force let alone when Paul says the gift is not for everyone anyway. <clears throat> okay. Um, if you're still having trouble and think that biblical tongues could still be this, it could still include this ecstatic speech um, and not just actual foreign languages, uh, here's something to think about. Really think about this. If it were the Spirit that gives the utterance for ecstatic speech, glossolalia, what exactly makes that miraculous? The reason I ask is because what is miraculous, by definition, 
is something that is impossible, right? Glossolalia is not impossible to do without the Holy Spirit. Speaking an actual foreign language you've never learned, which is called xenoglossia, not glossolalia, is impossible for people to do on their own. So that's why I say that's the only thing biblical speaking in other languages by the Spirit can be. Ecstatic speech, glossolalia, is something different, which anyone can do. It is not miraculous at all. Um, if you go to gotquestions.org, there's an article called What is Glossolalia? Um, it touches on a lot of this, the same things that I've just talked about. Um, and uh, Now, I'm sure many will accuse me of speaking in false tongues, yada yada, but that's actually my point, because they are doing exactly what I'm doing, glossolalia, not xenoglossia. They're not speaking in actual foreign languages that they've never learned either. That means they are false languages too. Pretending. <clears throat> yes. Is a false display of the biblical gift of speaking in other tongues. It's not an actual foreign language. <clears throat> and to say doing this thing, ecstatic speech, attaining to something that anyone can do, is how you know peace with God, that's a false gospel. That has nothing to do with having peace with God. Peace with God is about what has been done about your sin and being reconciled to Him through repentance and faith in His Son who died for your sins and rose again. Peace be with you in Jesus' name.